new time. I want us to uh, put a title of our message up right now, The Dangers of Fairness and Entitlement. This is an issue that uh, keeps coming back to me the more and more I relate to people around the earth and different nations. I've been talking to a lot of uh, missionaries and ministers and laity or people who are are working in secular realms and doing whatever God has called them to do. Each of us have our own call, but there are some some predominant mentalities that are evolving on the planet right now that are becoming detrimental to people. And I keep, as I say, running into this. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but first I want to say I had a wonderful time this last week. I thank God for the opportunity to go and see my children, and we had a great week there of time together with my son's time with my daughter's-in-law, time with my beautiful grandchildren, and we loved it. And it was cold the whole week, which was wonderful. It was super cold in, in when we went to Disneyland. It was so cold and raining, and I was ill-prepared, and my hands were frozen and could not move properly. I was trying to open the package, and my fingers would not bend, and I giggled with glee. I was, I was so happy to be that cold because, as you know, you hear me say all the time, I love it. And it was a, a time of ministry to me. The cold ministers to me. It does something on the inside of me. It changes me. And certain enzymes, I believe, certain enzymes, chemicals, and uh, endorphins are released into my bloodstream when I am cold. And I cannot achieve it any other way unless you put me someplace that is truly cold. And I love when I can no longer feel my ears and my nose. I like that cold feeling. And so I had a great time. That was probably the highlight of the whole week was the temperature. It was amazing how much temperature can make a difference in your life. Uh, here, it's, it's always warm. Right now, it's been cool. I get that. But gosh, it's, it's not. No, not, not, from, not from our perspective. We, we love cold. And so we had a wonderful time. And we appreciate all your prayers and individuals uh, different ones that blessed us to be able to take the trip, both in the United States that watch this video when I'm online. Thank you so much for your blessings. Also, other uh, ministries and individuals blessed us to be able to do it. And so everything was covered, all the expenses. We didn't have to do anything but just go. And God was so good to us on the trip. And I thank God for it. And so we had a wonderful time. And, and my children send their greetings to you, Tony, Michael, and and. Mizuho and Nicole and our three children, uh, uh, grandchildren, Amelia, Irina, and Logan. And Logan is so cute. He's so much fun to play with. And Irina and Amelia are growing. Amelia is getting smarter and smarter. And so it's so fun to watch our, grand, our grandchildren grow. But we're happy to be home. I was happy coming home yesterday. We didn't get much sleep. Well, Barbara didn't get hardly any sleep. She had to immediately start some work uh, when she got home. And, and I, I really thought about her as I slept while she was working. I, I slept from that time I got, I slept until like 12 o'clock yesterday, uh, around the middle of the day. But really, we didn't get home from the airport until past 6 in the morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm not good at sleeping in planes. I just kind of stay awake. I fall asleep, but it's that hit my head thing where you know my head falls and it startles me. So it's not very comforting. But here we are, and we're so glad to be back. And God bless every one of you. And I'm grateful to the Lord for bringing us back safely, especially in this day, in this hour, with what's taking place in Iran. Right now, tremendous things are happening in the nation of Iran. Keep praying. Keep praying. As I have been saying, it has the largest statistics, of the largest quantity of people converting to Christianity of any nation in the world right now. It has the fastest growing church. And the nation has basically had enough. Right now, they're standing in protest and demanding that the leaders of the nation be taken out. The entire nation, especially, is connected. The, what was the catalyst for them to stand in protest was that they shot down the Ukrainian uh, jetliner, killing 157 people. And, and that uh, so disturbed them. And you know, if Iran had, or the leaders of Iran had not really admitted, but they came right out and said it was, it was unintentional. But they did that. But that set off uh, a, a reaction. And now the nation is rising. So we're praying for them and asking for God's mercy. 
uh, on them in the nation and for them basically as a people to get the freedoms that they're looking for. Because that also will translate into the freedom of the, the ability of the gospel to continue to grow. Now, of course, the gospel grows in persecution. And because there was so much persecution there, that was one of the reasons why it grew so well up to now. But this is and can be an answer to prayer for the many new believers that are being baptized and that are coming to Christ. So, gosh, anything can have. If you had told me all that's happening right now in that nation, I would have never believed you just two years ago or three years ago. So when God moves, he moves quickly. And we're seeing this movement very fast around the planet. So just more indications of the fact that soon is his return. I believe that he's coming very quickly, and so I want to get ready. We had a great time today in the Human Relations and World Missions class at, at the other church where we do it in a day, and today there was a transference of power. There was a release of the anointing, and the people connected to, to that anointing, and that's the most important thing. I can stand up in front of a group and talk all day, but if the anointing is not connecting with hearts and minds, then there's not going to be really a difference made. I thank God today as I was teaching there was a connection where I spoke prophetically concerning Singapore and what Singapore is going to do in the missions movement in the future and how it's going to touch this planet. And uh, very specifically, the Holy Spirit was saying that this, this nation will have a higher percentage of its population going to the mission field than any nation in the history of this planet. And that's what I prophesied and what I truly believe. And so I'm excited to be a part of that. And of course, the there were several older people there, and I mentioned the geriatric crowd that's going to rise in their displeasure of retirement and their boredom. They're going to want something to do. And a few of the older women in the group were like, amen, yeah, hey, I'll do that. So I, God's going to raise those people up. Think about it. They're already funded missionaries. They have pensions. They have income. They're going to travel anyway. They're Singaporeans. That's what Singaporeans do. They travel around the world. So what better opportunity than to employ them than while they're doing this? Bring the gospel. Work in the nations. Uh, set up ministries for them to be able to do short-term and long-term. So I'm excited about the future of missions and what Singapore is going to do to touch the world. So we're going to continue to work toward that. Singapore is Antioch. Uh, I believe it, and we are, we are Antioch Center for the Nations, so out of that we will motivate the forces of this nation to be able uh, to do that. And I am not simply saying, or I'm not simply going to teach it, I will demonstrate it as I have with my entire life. My wife and I together have and are currently demonstrating the principle of missions, and we want everyone to get involved. Amen? The dangers of fairness and entitlement. I've spoken on this subject a few times, but in this past week, even though I was resting and I was not particularly focused on teaching anything or even preparing, God was speaking to me during the week. Sometimes God speaks more in your rest than in your seeking. You know what I mean? Like you can seek sometimes and pray and what's the message? What do you want me to say to your people? I say that all the time to God. This week I did not, I mean I love you all, but I didn't think about you even one time. I really didn't. I was just out of here. I was in Japan, enjoying Japan, having a good time. But the Lord was speaking to me in that sabbatical, if you will. And as he talked to me, this is one of the messages he gave. There's a few that I'll go through as these weeks coming. But I want to start an introduction by saying that the, the attitude of many people these days that I've observed is that of having something stolen from them. They, a lot of people feel not just that they, they don't have what they want, but that they've been ripped off. Like they're living life and they're angry because they don't have the things they want, presupposing that those things are theirs. And if you, can, if you can be convinced that everything belongs to you or anything belongs to you that is not actually yours at a given time, then you begin to develop a mentality that that thing was taken from you. Uh, they feel they've been ripped off. They feel they're not sufficiently cared for. They feel that, and this is not one individual. If you're here tonight and you feel this way or you're watching online and you feel this way, you're not alone. This is, it is a mentality that has bred itself 
on planet Earth right now, and I want to kind of expose it. I want to talk about it. And there never seems, for this mentality, there never seems to be enough, and everyone has what you want, and they should give it to you. That's the mentality. That, that what you have, why don't I have it? And if you have it, I should have it. Why should anyone have anything that I can't have? I should have everything that everyone else has. And so this mentality begins to eat away at you so that wherever you go and whatever you see and whatever people have, you feel cheated because that's yours. And it's not in your hands. It's not in your grip. So therefore, because you feel this, you suffer because of a misunderstanding of actual facts. And the Bible speaks about this in different passages. So we see what people have, we want that, but this is what it all means. Meaning that the people have accepted that there should be a standard of common possession and equality for all that excludes the concepts of you get what you pay for or you get what you work for. Those are concepts, work ethic, that you know, you get exactly what you put into something. You get out of it what you put into it. These ideas of uh, shoulder to the wheel, you know, nose to the grindstone, uh, these old expressions, you don't hear them anymore. Nobody's thinking about these ethics of labor and function. But scripturally, we go and we find so much about reciprocity, sowing, don't be deceived. And this is a word I want to talk about a little bit. The Bible talks a lot about deception. And the enemy is rising like never before to deceive, not just the people of the world, but to deceive, to deceive God's people. Like we saw when we talked about Antichrist, even the very elect, even those of us whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we stand a chance of being deceived by these mentalities because these mentalities are put before us. Now, the lust of the eyes is more prevalently put before us, the opportunities to lust from the eyes, more than ever before because of Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We get to look and see all these goods and things that we want and study them. We have come to the point of ceremoniously worshiping objects to such a degree that we will watch endless videos of the unboxing of things that we want. We will watch someone unbox an iPhone with, with glee, just so happy to see it and watch it and ooh, ooh, slightly drooling. Oh, wouldn't it be great to have that? Wouldn't it be wonderful? And the eyes now are being bombarded from every angle with things that we see and that we want. And because we hope for it and then later we don't get it, our hope deferred in us makes our hearts sick and we become depressed and angry and furious at everyone and then we become jealous and bitter because people have things and we need to be really careful about this. And this comes from this mentality, like I was saying, we develop a sense of, um, a sense of unfairness or inequality presupposing that equality is right. I can ask the question to many people, do you think that there should be equality, that everybody on earth should have exactly the same things? Do you think, I think that would be ideal and great, but do you think that is a necessity? And a lot of people would say, well, yeah, that would be nice, but this is not even scriptural. It's not possible. So therefore, sometimes we will have and sometimes we will not have. So we need to adjust some of our mentalities. The Bible supports the view of you get what you work for. The world right now has a different standard. So to remedy any malady, as I say here, to remedy any malady of mind, we must first establish what is the cure. If you have a disease, we have a pharmacist here today. I could mention, I could take physician's success reference and go into it and, and use symptomology to find all of these diseases and things. And he probably could tell you a good medicine for it, couldn't you? Because you study that. You know that. So I could ask the pharmacist here about what would I take if this and that. He would know. And so it's the same when there's an illness of mind or heart or soul. There is a medicine. So let's just say that the Bible is our pharmacy. And the scriptures are drugs that we can take to bring remedy to our problems. We just need to find them. Now, the world, of course, doesn't have that. So what is the medicine of our unsettled minds? It is the standard of correct in an incorrect world. That's what we need. Well, for the world, it's people. Uh, and it's people. It's the standard of correctness is what? Popular opinion, like we've just been talking about. 
So you study psychology. It talks about certain types of equality, about certain things you should expect and demand. But for us who believe, what is our standard, or at least should be? God's word. God's word should be the source of all of our information. Yes, there are many different sources of information. There are certain sciences that I find fascinating. I read many things. But ultimately, I must put God's word first. And the biggest danger for a child of God is not replacing popular opinion with scriptural fact. In fact, that is the washing of the water of the word. The more we know the Bible, the less we will think in error. Because the world is going to teach us many things that those things are designed as traps to bring us into a place of misery. So we need to remedy that. So having said this, let's examine this subject that I'm talking about, the dangers of fairness, entitlement, and these feelings of fairness, these ideas through the looking glass of Scripture. So we're going to consider this, but we're going to look at it through the Word of God. And I will mention that the concept or pattern of entitlement is mostly honestly, these days, is enabled by parents. And if the children today have the mentalities they have, they had to learn it somewhere, not just, and usually parents allow this, because I have seen a difference. I have known other groups of children. I have known homeschool children, for instance, that are in an environment where they're hearing a certain idea about what they can and cannot have. Certain principles are taught them from the word of God, and they do not suffer from this, not at all, because they had to learn it from something and from somewhere. And a lot of my experiences with families, especially young families, is the parents themselves are passing on these attributes because now they're arising what was just a child yesterday, today is a mother and a father. And now they're teaching because they never did. And these are believers I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just the people in the world. We cannot hold them to account of their knowledge of Scripture because they don't even see it as a necessary source. But for us, it certainly should be. So we turn to the Bible for help. And this pattern of entitlement, we just want our children to be happy. So basically, we give them many things. We spoil them, as we used to say. And before long, uh, uh, they're, they're expecting everything. And if they don't get it, they're angry. I remember one time that we, we spoiled the children of my pastor. The really wonderful thing in our, in our life is that we were able to try out a lot of things in child rearing on someone else's children. So we had actually eight children in that family. Then we moved to the fish, mission field and we had um, four children, five. Yeah, five, Brother Victor and Ruth Ann's um, children. And so we were employed as nannies, uh, on par, uh, and we raised these children through a part of their life, and we tried a lot of different forms and patterns, and we saw things that didn't work. One of the things was that we just wanted to have fun with them all the time and, and bless them. Well, we created little monsters because they would be so used to doing so many things that when we, one time, um, we, what is it we did with Mary Elizabeth? We, we did many things. We went like to the zoo and to a park and we drove her to Florida. It was a, it, to a beach. This is like a, like a five hour drive all the way there. By, we were paying for it all. Let them have fun on the beach, beautiful white sands, green, blue green water. Had a great time, brought them all the way back. Five minutes after getting home, she wanted to do something and we couldn't because that's right, wanted to simply run a video. And she actually said the words, I never get to do one thing. We just spent the whole day taking her to the beach and doing, like, they, we spoiled them. And we found out that a, a culture of entitlement evolved because we gave them way too much. We just wanted them happy. We just want to see them smile. Recently, I watched one of, uh, one of my favorite comedians, Dana Carvey. He did a stand-up about his children in a similar pattern. He said he had his son, and he took him to Rome. And his son suffered terribly from entitlement. So he's standing in the Colosseum, you know, the Roman Colosseum, famous place. And Dana is in awe about this. And his son is there. He's like, you know, a, a meh teenager. And his son looks at him and he, and he says, son, isn't this amazing? And he says, is this pretty much all we're going to do the whole time we're here? Standing in the Colosseum. And he says, yes, this is what we're going to do. He says, this is what we're going to do. Like mumbled and walked off. 
And very funny, he said a lot of things I cannot repeat on this microphone right now, but very funny comedy routine about kids and about the way they act when they have been given so much. I remember years ago, um, I'll send you a copy if you're interested, it was written by Paul Harvey, The Things I Wish For You. And it's a list of negative things that he wished for young people. Because every one of them were character building and really taught them about life. One of them was, for instance, I, I wish for you that one of your pets dies in your arms. And that sounds terrible, doesn't it? But think about what you learn in that moment. You learn so many things about life. It's a beautiful list. Paul Harvey was a great speaker. He was also a minister of the gospel for years and one of the most famous public figures in radio. And uh, he had a show called The Rest of the Story. Great teacher. But he, he saw it coming and knew. And there are a lot of people that saw this, this end age coming that would be a realm in which men become lovers of themselves and that everything is about self and everything is about what I need. And if, we, if we're not careful, we get contaminated with these mentalities and, and this happens. And I worry about my child, uh, my youngest, of course. She's, the little, she's our little princess girl, Sarah Jane, in our house. And we have a tendency to just kind of give in to her, whatever she wants. We, we love her. We bless her. But we also bring balance. And we often draw a line and say, no, we can't do that. It's just not possible. I know you want it, but and we explain. And she has been battling with that. She's 13. It's about that age. But recently when we were in Disney World, I was really blessed to see something that happened that I had never seen in her before. And we went into one of the little shops, and she wanted this little figure, this little stuffy. And there are five main characters now at Disney, Disney Sea. And these are little figures. It's kind of like Disneyland, Disney World has Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. Well, Disney Sea created a whole different group of characters. She really likes those. So we went in there, and she had a certain amount of money, and uh, she, she wanted something, but she wanted to watch her money. So she's real careful. So she just picked out one, but she couldn't pick it out was the problem. I said, well, pick one of the five and just get the one. She couldn't do it. She struggled. She looked. She struggled. She looked. She struggled, she looked, she, she couldn't. So I put all five on my fingers and I held them out hanging and I said, look, here's all five. Which one of these do you want? Well, I, I really don't know. I, just, I said, well, you have to pick one. And she said, well, no. And I said, you know what? Let's just get them all. I know you don't have enough money, but daddy's going to get these. So I just want to do that. She said, no. She actually grabbed my arm. I said, no, 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 no. That's too much. That's the first time those words ever came out of my daughter's mouth. It's always the opposite. I've never heard her say that. She said, no, Dad, that's too much. No, 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 no. And I said, no. Well, you know me, soft-hearted. Because I saw that she got that, I bought all five of them. But that's just my right as a daddy to do what I want. But what my point is, she said no. And I, and I insisted, I said, no, let's just get them all. She said, no, no, that's too much. You don't need to do that. And I said, no, I want them. And I'm going to get them. And if you don't want them, fine. I'll play with them and I'll hang them in my room. And of course, they're all in her room. But we have a responsibility as parents to make sure that they don't always feel, that's mine, this is mine, I need that. We need to help carefully bring them around uh, in the nurture and the admonition of God's love through us. Provoking them not to anger, because you can make them angry, the Bible says, but we want to help them. And we start, of course, in ourselves, recognizing these patterns. And in all honesty, to restrict and withhold a thing is often better than providing it at all times. Uh, sometimes abstinence from an activity is better than freedom to do it. And it teaches patterns to our children and to ourselves about there are limits and their self Control. We learn those things. Sometimes, if not, we're going to go out there and learn it the hard way. We're going to spend all our money on something stupid, then we have our electricity cut. How many have ever had your electricity cut off? That's, that's a really embarrassing thing. It's happened to me before. Um, I have had bills I couldn't pay because I misspent my money. And those lessons you really only learn once. That day, the landlord came, and, and I didn't pay the rent. And my thought was, well, you know, I'll pay it a few days late. But he came to the door, and he says, no. You're going to have to get out. I remember that feeling of shock. Oh, this terrible man, slumlord coming to drive. No, he was right. But my problem is at that moment, I had a disease called entitlement. 
I thought somehow I had a right to stay in that place for a longer period. But when I felt the weight of his anger, I, I met authority in him. And I found the money, and I paid it. And we never were late again in all these years since then. We, it's just the feeling of it was so bad. Because somehow we were deceived to think that other things were more important than the roof over our head. That's, a, that's really kind of crazy, but it's, you, you don't realize it until you get into trouble for those things. And that's a process we have to go to. And sometimes to restrict things. And by the way, this is the way God the Father raises us all. God does not just give us whatever we want. He blesses us at times. Now, he blessed Abraham, but he first waited for him to offer Isaac. So, yes, he will bless us, but he's looking for us to learn principles before that. So, now I want to go to the passage that triggered all this. And this passage really is, actually some other events triggered all this. And as the Lord was speaking to me, two individuals that I observed on this trip that, uh, that well, the good thing not, not related to me in that sense, but one individual especially, I saw this concept in full bloom in a person working in a place that my um, children work and they operate, and this one individual just showed me so much of that disease. They're living it entirely, breaking things, knocking over glasses in the restaurant, and like, it was in the way. No, you broke it, and then watching the cook clean it up, and like, oh, you want me to help you with that? Of course, you broke it. Like that, you see it in people that they think that, well, it shouldn't have been there. They, everything is someone else's fault, other principle. And I found this in scripture as I was thinking about it. And so I'm going to show us seven deceptions of the concept of fairness in time. Because when we are under this, we're deceived. And you remember the definition of deception. When you're deceived, you don't know it. That's why it's called deception. Because <laughs> you're deceived. How can you possibly see that it's wrong when you are totally convinced that something is right. Jesus said, be careful when the darkness in you, you call light. And that the light that you think you have is actually darkness. He says, oh, how dark that darkness is. When you're deceived and think you're right when you're wrong, it is a deep pit. And entitlement is just another form of deception. Now, I'm not talking about I want to clarify this as we get into this. If you work a job and you've put in hours and contractually are promised a sum of money, that's not entitlement. That is, you are entitled. That's your money. You earn that. That's different. I'm talking about things you didn't work for. I'm talking about things you don't really deserve. Things that you just want. It's another thing. If you want something, you can earn it but you're going to have to go do something to get it, and that's not always what we want. An entitlement is someone that wants something they haven't worked for, basically. And there's certain reasons why. But if you're deep enough in this deception, you will never see the reasons why as your fault. But it will always be a reallocation of blame to someone or something else that made you not able to do or to have what you want. Seven deceptions of the concept of fairness and entitlement. Number one is we believe our mentality is correct. Now I want to start with this group of people. Very famous passage in Matthew 25, verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now, as we're looking at this, I want us to consider some important principles about this passage where it says, for instance, that these are virgins. Now, for the sake of our study, we are not singling out young females. This applies to everybody. This is a scriptural pattern. This is an analogy. So therefore, as a parable, it is meant to apply to a variety of individuals. It can be a man, a woman, a boy, a girl. Any human being can be one of these ten in this social gathering of people as they are together. Now, the very first thing in this passage says, at that time. What does at that time mean here? Well, the previous chapter really creates the stage upon which this story takes place. 
because in that chapter, chapter 23 of Matthew, it's kind of a, a, like a tiny book of revelations. In other words, in that book, he talks about the end is coming. Remember the passage. Remember what they saw. It's where he says, watch out that no one deceives you. And is that the next slide you see there? Watch out that no one is not there. It's not? Okay, it's in my notes. I don't know why I'm almost there. Oh, there it is. Watch out that no one deceives you. Now, this is part of that chapter that precedes the chapter where the story of the ten virgins is. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when the disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Do you see these things, all these wonderful buildings? He asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. Now, you have to think about what happened here because as they were walking through the temple courts in the area where these big buildings were, and they were gorgeous, beautiful structures were built there in the time of Christ. They were there. As he's walking through, they were, wow, it'd be like going to Manhattan or going to Tokyo where we just were walking around Akihabara. Wow, what an amazing place. If you've never been to Akihabara, it's mind-blowing. I tried to explain it to somebody. How can I explain this? I said, it's basically for Singapore, and it's like, take Orchard, the whole strip, and multiply it by about 10,000 and make an entire region that's like a really grown-up orchard. It's massive, and most of it is, of course, I took my daughter. The Sarah Jane Day was the last day, and we went there to Akihabara and went to every little shop because she's really into anime and to these figures and different things, so we went. There's entire buildings filled with only Gundam figures. There's entire buildings with models of airplanes, entire buildings, like anything. It is Amazing. I could spend a vacation just in Akihabara and be thrilled. There's a place called Super Potato that you can go buy a vintage Atari 2600 with the original combat four pixels on one object. The old video games, they actually have the, the games. You can get the, the old NES, the Famicom, and every Nintendo. If you have a Nintendo Cube, you these probably before some of your times. I go all the way back to, I go back to the Timex Sinclair, and uh, all the way back to the Atari 2600. I was too poor to have the Atari 2600, but my neighbor had it, and I was over there 12 hours a day playing his. We just, that's all we did, and all that's there, wonderful things. And so we go down there, and we look around. This is what the disciples are experiencing, this amazing moment. Wow, look at this. And Jesus says, oh, you like this? Isn't that great? You know what? It's all coming down. And it's really disappointing. Now, he tells them this, but doesn't say any more. They leave. So he really kind of bummed them out. They were having a fun time seeing the beautiful sights. And wow, they were sightseeing. And then all of a sudden, he says, yeah, it's all going to burn. Come on, let's go. So they're walking all the way out to the Mount of Olives, which, by the way, is a long walk. And the whole time, I imagine they're thinking about that. So they get over there where they're going, and as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. First thing out of his mouth, watch out that no one deceives you. And it's the same understanding of the very elect being fooled and these things. In the end, there will be such a deception that goes out. The enemy actually will be granted greater powers, almost hypnotic force, over the masses. And it will continue to grow until the actual reign of Antichrist that we talked about. But by and large, out there, whenever you are just in life, right now the world is designed to deceive you. And everybody's believing so many lies. If I told you a bunch of lies, you would be appalled that I said they were lies because you think they're truth. That's how deep it is. We could sit down privately and I could lay down a bunch of things that you think are reality on the planet right now. I'm not going to say them right now because I'm online. And it would be so upsetting to so many people. I would be polarized to a group and probably thrown out of this group or that group or these people. And I would get criticized. I'm not going to do that. But watch out that you don't be deceived because there's a lot of stuff going on out there that people are believing that's not true. So he's telling him this. And I believe that we're living in the generation that Jesus, he goes on there and talks about everything that's going to happen and the despair and tribulation that's coming and all that. And so in the very next chapter, he goes into our story about being ready for that, about being prepared in the end. 
And this is the story of these ten virgins. So I believe that we're living in that generation that Jesus was depicting in this story. And so the remedy he's offering is our remedy for now. I also have observed it is pretty consistent that there's this mentality on the planet. And in most societies around, I've come across this mentality every place. And I think the reason it is consistently equally found in many nations is because simply the internet is allowing everyone to have one pool of thought. And so a society, for the first time, a global society is evolving. And think, well, what about one more government? It's already here. It's already here. We're being governed by the things that we see. We don't even know they're controlling us. But a lot of things we see and believe now, uh, you, you need to really be careful in this day and age and take everything with a grain of salt, as my mother used to tell me. You know, peer at everything with skepticism. Consider, you say, well, you sound like one of those um, conspiracy theorists. Yes, I am. Because there are many conspiracies going on right now that are part of this overall deception. Thank God we have an anointing. We need not that any man teach. We have the unction of the Spirit to give us messages like this, to help us, to show us the scriptures, to open our eyes. And so at the very beginning of this parable, we see that Jesus is trying to teach us about the difference between foolishness and wisdom. In this age, in those end times, be careful. It's kind of like this. There's these ten virgins. And he starts to tell this story so that he can draw a line between what is foolish and what is wise so that he can help us within the realms of his kingdom. So in this story, half of the people are wise and half of them are foolish. In other words, uh, what determines wisdom and foolishness in the story is what follows. So if you want to know the difference between wisdom and foolishness, what it is to be wise, what it is to be foolish, we're going to find it in this story. And it's pretty clear that you will see it. So a woman who believed, this is interesting about deception, a woman who believed that she was entitled to eat any of the fruit in a certain garden wanted that she wanted committed the very first sin on earth. It was another form of entitlement. You understand? So how did she possibly believe that? Where did the idea come from that even though she was limited and told she could not have it, she decided she deserved it and should have it. Well, it's, 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 it's not a trick question. We know how. The devil. He was there to be able to plant. You see, she was deceived by the devil. How did she possibly believe that after having been clearly told by God, God told her. So you had two voices in that garden. You had God's voice speaking to man, and you had the devil's voice speaking to man. And that's pretty much how it is to this day. So what are the channels of the voices? We have God's word. I would say listen to God's word even before you listen to me preach. Please. Because I could end up being deceived in some area. I'm not saying that I think I am at this moment concerning this subject. But it certainly is possible because I'm a fallible man. I'm an individual. But his word, the pure word of God, will never misguide you. It's there. Read it carefully. And so here we see this. She was deceived. And this is why Jesus is warning us in this story about these ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. The enemy remains the same today as he's always been. And the only difference is that now he has used psychology and reasoning and popular opinion. You can sit and watch many talk shows. You can watch news shows. And they have this panel of experts. How many of you have ever seen a panel of experts on a news broadcast? And they're specialists, and they say why they're specialists and what their degrees are. And this is, you know, the leader of NASA's meteorological society. And this is, uh, he worked for the U.S. government and worked for the U.K. And then this guy, he's Harvard, Cambridge, you know, everything. This guy, you know, invented pizza, whatever. You got these people that are obviously the authorities. And so you think, well, they must know. No, they don't know. They don't. We're living in such an age, you have to be very, very careful. His word, his word is truth. His word has to be the only light to your feet, the only lamp, the only illumination to your walk. Because everything is coming down. That's what Jesus said to him. See this? It's all coming down. And he says it to us today. It's all coming down. So be ready for this. Jesus is warning them. Psychology is used. People trust and they replace what is truth 
like God, don't eat that. But they replace it with reason and they think about it after they've heard it. And if they don't go back, what if Eve had gone back to God with her changing mentality? Imagine how different it would have been. God, can I talk to you? Of course. Of course, my child. You know the serpent. Because she knew the serpent. He knew the serpent. Later the serpent came up, but it was too late. But what if she had preemptively gone to God and said, I just need your counsel about something. You see, the serpent told me that what you told me about the fruit is not actually true. And that you don't want me to have it because. What do you think God would have said? He would have said in that moment, oh dear, no, let me explain it to you. Wouldn't he have clarified to her if she had actually asked him? But she didn't. She took things into her own mind. She looked at the fruit and saw how delightful it looked and how it was desirable to make someone wise like God. She thought about it, processed it, and because of the poison of the concept of entitlement planted by the devil himself, she took it. And we are where we are today. Thank you, Eve. Number two. Uh, one of the deceptions is we do not prepare. Now, the foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now, you know, all these women are waiting for one bridegroom to come, because back then it was very common that multiple wives would marry one man, if the man could truly afford it. This is obviously a very wealthy man. He's also the image given by Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to us as himself, as the bridegroom, and we are the bride of Christ. So this is us. In perfect, clear analogy, this is church people. Because who's getting married to the bridegroom? The churches. The spirit and the bride say, come to the bridegroom. And so 10 of these people could very possibly be 10 believers all waiting for what we're waiting for. And so once again, this is pretty frightful because five of these church people are doing something different than the five that are doing the right thing. So it's not a question of whether or not some are wrong or some are right. We know that some are wrong or some are right. But what we have to go after is the motivation for their wrongness. So here we see this, though. They simply didn't prepare. We see the immediate divergence of choices made by this group of 10 people. Some took oil, some did not. Some had some oil in their lamp, but others. And I was, I was praying about this today and asking the Holy Spirit. I saw that the Lord told me, well, they all had lamps. The wise people took oil in jars apart from their lamps. And this is what the Lord explained to me. The lamp they carried represents what is most visible in the here and now. A lamp in your hands is the device that is lit. It would be like your hand phone, your iPhone, or your Android device. I'm sorry for you if you have that, but if you have the proper tool, an iPhone, you have it in your hand, you have this great device, and it's wonderful. And it has a battery life, does it not? It is going to last. You pretty much know the hours of your device, depending on what you're doing. Uh, some have longer, some shorter, and it gets progressively worse as your device gets older. You end up with a phone that's got like two hours in it and is miserable. And that's when you look at everybody else's phone and feel entitled to have what they have. How dare he have an iPhone 11 when I should have the iPhone 11. So anyway, back to this. These people, it's kind of like that. The lamp they carry represents the visible, what's the here and now, the device in the hand. That lamp is a device. The lamp is symbolic of what is obvious and clear. It's physical. It's present. They hold it. They have it. They need it now. It is the device they will use to illuminate themselves so that they can get around and meet in case the master comes in dark, which they're expecting, because why else would they have lamps? They use lamps to walk at night. They don't have street lights or these things, so it's a necessary device. Now, the oil represents what is not immediately needed. You understand? At that moment, they did not need the extra oil, but in fact were projecting into the future a need that had yet to arise. They're looking at the future and considering that I will need it then, but right now I don't need it, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't have it. So we start to see this divergence of mentalities already and that they had forethought. This forethought 
of the necessity of oil at a future time shows us the principle of preparedness or wisdom. Wisdom directs you to prepare. Wisdom says, if you're going to the cinema to watch the new Star Wars movie, bring a jacket with you because it's freezing in those cinemas. You know by experience, but you may bring a cover. How many of you, when you go see a movie, you bring, you make sure? But not me, of course, because it's never cold enough. Which, by the way, I was on a Scoot airline flight. Our, we almost died. We, it was so hot in that airplane. We begged them, please. And nobody else is fanning. It's people, you know, these, oh, lots of Asians, of course, they have jackets on and stuff. And I swear to you, it was 29 degrees inside that plane. I'm not exaggerating. And they had sweaters on and their arms folded. And we were like fanning ourselves and sweating and asking the flight attendant, Could, can you maybe turn the air on? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go tell them. And no, he did not lie to us because nobody else was suffering. So in this case, here they are. They're prepared for a time, not now. So it's another form of faith, right? What's the definition of faith? The substance of things hoped for. So it's something real now, but it's not even needed yet. It will be needed then. So here we see the growth of wisdom or the exposure to it. They were prepared, but when you have the mentality of the five unwise, you don't see this, and it's the beginning of a problem that later will cause greater problems, which will inevitably end up in your expulsion from heaven. That's how serious this is. That if you don't nip this in the bud, if you don't take care of this early from the very root of it, then it will grow into a thing that could very well stop you from... I was, I was talking about somebody who was arriving late. And the question was, look, this employee, um, my son was talking to me, this employee comes late all the time. But there's always a reason why. There's always an excuse. Well, it's one thing. Now, if you come late to church, look, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people getting paid. This is a job, right? So these people are employees. And in that moment, he's telling me about this. And I made the blunt statement. Said, you know what? Being late can put you in the lake of fire. Think about it. Later on, you know the end of this story. I'm not stealing any thunder to the story and what's going to happen. You know five make it and five don't. And five of them are on one side of a door and five of them are on the other side of a door. It's that simple. Five are inside, five are outside. This is very scary. So if we can go back in time and find out exactly what put them on the outside of the door, in actuality, the only thing was is they were too late, which in, in itself is an extremely scary principle that lateness can cause you to go to the lake of fire. Lateness can send you to hell. Stephen, that's extreme. You can't say that. That certainly can't be true. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. This is why I make such a big deal about punctuality all the time. That's why it is a very important thing. And if you hear very successful people very often, one of the main things they've learned in life is that somebody told them, who is it uh, recently? Chris Pratt, a uh, famous actor. And he was quoted as saying, he, they asked him, who, who do you attribute your success to? He says, my first producer in my first acting position told me, he has only one rule, never be late. That was it. And he said, if, if you are late at all, it's over. And he said it stuck with him. And he says that that one principle for him is the reason why his career is successful. Not only was he on time, but early. And more things happened to provide for him other opportunities because he was just present that other actors were late that he had opportunities, he had things. But anyway, getting off on a tangent of lateness. But it is an issue here in the regard of what can deceive us. And so this oil represents something that is not yet needed. We need to be prepared. We need to have the oil. And most of us who suffer from some form of this deception of entitlement and fairness live in the moment of now. That's really the big issue. So all you care about is right now. Doesn't matter what tomorrow, eat, to eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Hey, you're like the king of a, of a country, and you just get this, do that, and you, you easily spend money, and you just, do, you're not taking forethought about what is going to be needed later. And so often funds are exhausted early, and then before more fundage can come, it's all gone. And so you have this season of unfair famine 
where the enemy has attacked you. The devil is attacking me. I don't have ice cream because Lucifer hates me. And, and, but it really is not Lucifer's fault. You just spent all your money on something else. If you had forethought, you would know, you know what, I can have this, but I'm not going to be able to have ice cream next week. And that's fine. If you're reasonable enough to think it through, then fine. That's called self-discipline. That's wisdom. But this entitlement is dangerous. It projects an image of an inability to consider the outcome of our current actions. So not caring about tomorrow is technically the definition of foolishness. It's not worrying about what comes after. It's uh, just live for yourself, do whatever, it doesn't matter. No, there is, there's so much depending upon our ability to function wisely, including eternity. And consider the ant, the Bible says. What does it say about the ant? Though it's a tiny little thing, it says he stores food for the winter. The ant stores food. Did you ever bust open an ant nest and look on the inside? And they have huge storages of sustenance to feed their young and to eat on so they can survive. God created us the same way. But we talk to the devil. So we're not like ants. Ants are not having talks with the devil. The demons are not leading the ants away into chaos. Ants are programmed by God to do the right thing. We are also, but we're creative. The greatest blessing is our greatest downfall. We have an imagination. And we can invent ideas and thoughts. And we can dream. But be careful that it doesn't turn into this kind of entitlement. Now, because this, is, this story is a spiritual analogy of kingdom living, we need to see that it is not preparing for eternity that it's talking about. It's not just not preparing. with It's talking about the end. And what's the context again? Everything ending. It's all going to end. When the Son of Man returns, he's talking about it. In that time, when I come back, that last generation, that last time, it's like this. That generation, it will be like this. There's 10, and he tells this story. So he's talking about now. And this is why this is so serious to me. Watch out that no one deceives you, he says. Number three, we are deceived by boredom. I'm so bored. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, this, this means that the wise and the unwise both suffered from this boredom. Because boredom is real, by the way. Boredom does happen. It's easy to get bored. You stuck long enough in a place, you can get bored. So there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's other responses that surround it. But we are deceived by boredom. If you're wise, you know what boredom is, and you know how it works in your life, and so you're able to measure yourself. So at midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. Now, this one that calls out the crier was someone who often was in a tower or uh, in, in a high place on a mountaintop or a hill that had a horn to make announcements because they could see perhaps in a valley or in a far distance when Groups were coming, and they would recognize from a distance the standard and the accompaniment of their master. This is a very wealthy individual. So as he's coming, he's able to give them enough time to say, he's coming, get ready. So this is what's happening in the story. Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps because they all had the lamps. They all had them to light, and they did so. So when you think you're not getting paid for instance. This is how I see it in the spiritual lens. When you think you're not getting paid, you have a tendency to lack interest and, and grow bored. In other, words, you, in other words, you're not getting something out of it. Now, so boredom and or disinterest in your function can get you fired. Let's look at a, a job. In a job, you can get fired because of boredom. I had some uh, instance where uh, a foot reflexologist was doing um, a foot massage and they put their handphone between the feet they were massaging and every time a message would come up they would look at it and like do that pet thing you know they do to you with like they're not really doing their job and, they, and just kind of 
Like, no, no, not for what you pay for foot reflexology, you're not going to do that. So what do you do? You go to the manager and you complain. This person is doing this. Now, what happens to such an employee? They get fired. Doesn't take but a few times to do something like that, that they will get fired. Why? Because they're bored. Bored with what? Bored with your job? You're getting paid to do that. And you see this. Why? Because that young person that was in that position suffered from this idea of entitlement. I believe they're entitled to the freedom to look on that handphone and do it. Today, I stopped briefly somewhere and I was waiting for someone to wait on me. And they do that thing where they, they turn their back to you and walk like that to so make sure that they don't see you. And they just pretend like they're cleaning. And all those things are because they believe that they're, they have the right to not have to do their job. I know because I did this as a young man. I remember getting fired. I remember my boss telling me, Stephen, we're going to have to let you go. And I said, well, well, what do you mean, let me go? He said, we're, we're no longer going to need you here with us at the pet shop. And I was like, well, what does that mean? You want me to work less hours? He said, no, we're letting you go. And I'm so stupid. Like, I'm like, what do you mean? You're letting, like, you, what do you mean? You're fired. I, I made him say it. Like, I pushed the poor man to say he was trying to be nice. Was, You're fired. And then it all came out. You hide behind the aquarium when customers come in. You're not helping anyone. You spend an hour at a time in the toilet. Like he went down a whole list of things. At this point, I really don't trust people until they've been fired. When you get fired, you learn about life. And I learned about life. My next job was at a Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers. And I worked hard. I was afraid of getting fired every minute. I was making sure I was doing everything. And as a result, I became an employer of the month very quickly, and I went up very quickly in the ranks, and they valued me. And uh, I was so scared going to get the job, the supervisor saw the fear and said to the other manager interviewing me, who is this young man? He said, well, he's applying for the grillman position, and honestly, we, I don't know, I'm seeing, he said, hire him. And the manager said, well, I'm, I just started the interview. He says, you don't need to do any more, hire him. That supervisor had enough wisdom to, he saw the fear on me and he recognized that was respect because I got fired and it's a valuable lesson. And this is one of the, unfortunately, it's one of the hard ways that we learn things. But boredom can lie to you. And I've noticed uh, a, a transitive boredom in this generation, meaning it is contagious because you develop a pool of people that you talk about. Oh my God, can you believe they want me to mop every day? You know, and you go talk to them and they say to you, that's terrible, oh, you're like some kind of slave. Oh. And they, they pet each other and it's so hard, right? I know, I'm not gonna work there, I'm not getting job somewhere else. And they, they end up comforting one another with a lie and the entitlement is perpetuated and they wonder why this unfair business is firing everybody. And it's because nobody has the work ethic anymore. I tell you what, right now, if you dare actually have work principles about you and you are really focused, you will rise so quickly in the ranks of anything on the planet right now because service mentality is vanished. If you're a real servant, you go out there, you will, you will work your way to management in no time. That's what my children, both of them, have recently done. Short period of time, because they actually work. They actually do the job. They take things seriously. Immediately, they have worked their way up through from a place just to get a part-time job at this restaurant, now managing three of them and ordering for all those restaurants. My son is like running multiple. He, so quick he went up. You know why? He shows up. He actually goes to work, and he's on time. And in a pool of employees that most of them are late all the time and some just don't show up. One guy came to get the job and my son had him behind the bar and there's a bar there and they have alcohol and the guy said, is it okay if I have a drink? This is his first day of work. And my son said, yeah, you can have, you can have something. Well, the man drank like a bottle of vodka on his, like a whole bottle of vodka. And of course he got drunk. And then he goes out and he disappears. And my son's like, where is this guy? He goes out and he's passed out on the stairs outside. Not a good service mentality. Missing, just 
What made that individual think that he was entitled to drink an entire bottle of vodka? And you may think, well, he may have been an alcoholic. <laughs> Maybe. But the fact is, he took and did things. It's, 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 we see it everywhere. And this is how I know we're in the, in the last age. Because people are deceived by boredom. And the reason we become disinterested or bored is because we do not understand the importance of the things around us. We end up not valuing what's surrounding us. And this is the definition of foolishness. Again, it's important to teach our children this. Value everything. Everything has a cost. Everything someone sacrificed for. There's this mentality Barbara and I used to make fun of called the institution pays. That you go, if you work at a place, you think, well, the company will cover that. No, the company is people that are spending their money. Like, there's never an institution that covers, oh, yeah, they don't care, they count that in. They count that cost, they cover that, they figure that in. No, they don't. That mentality, once again, is that entitlement. Think about Joseph, how he worked for Pharaoh. Think about Daniel. Think about the accountability and the focus and the dedication of God's people in the scriptures. Don't be deceived by boredom. Number four. We depend upon others for what is our responsibilities. This is a big one. The foolish ones said to the wise. Now, here they are in that circumstance. The bridegroom is on his way. Everybody get up and they're running around, packing their bags, lighting their lamps, all excited. Oh, my God, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. They're all happy and giddy and excited. Oh, oh my God, I don't have any oil. Oh, do you have any oil? They realize at that moment, I don't have enough oil. So what do they do? What's the first thing they do? It says it, the foolish ones say to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. So their lamps are burning up because the oil that was there was consumed in the waiting, and now the future is present. And what they didn't prepare for is there. Jesus is coming back. If we don't prepare for it, when the time comes, will we have what is necessary to make it in the last hour? If we have oil, we will. If we're prepared before him, we will. If we mentally prepare ourselves, living principles before the time comes, but we depend upon others sometimes. So all of these people work together in one group of ten. We see the ten of them together. They were a soulful group connected to one another with the same goal and purpose. You understand, they were all going to be sister wives together in a community. They had the same purpose, to become wives to the bridegroom who's returning to them. And sometimes in a social group, we begin to feel that we have all things in common. It's almost another form of communism that, well, you know, what's yours is mine. But it's so funny because what's mine is not yours. It's usually the mentality of the one that believes that what's yours is mine. And in this case, they think what's yours is mine. And I guarantee you after... And although this is, is true about many things, we accept that there, there's a time of response. But sometimes we need to share. Of course, and the Bible tells us to share. And we will. If you don't have because of circumstances beyond your control, if you don't have because you've not had opportunity, maybe you're impoverished because you were born in a place and it's not your fault, then that's different. I can do something to help you, but not forever just so that I can bring you up to a place that you can, can become productive. This is the way societies work. We can loan. We can help. We can bring people step by step to develop and go through these things. But we have to be very careful. If, or if not, we're going to depend upon other people for the responsibilities that we should. We have to take responsibility for our present. And if we do, it'll dictate our, our future. Number five, we're going to finish now. We feel... That what belongs to others is rightfully ours? No, they replied. Now, these are the wise ones talking. There may not be enough for both of us. So why didn't they just go with the sinking ship? Why didn't they say, you know what, we're sisters. So yes, if I run out, I run out. If you run out, we're going to run out together. No, they didn't. Why? Because they're not communists. Because God does not create communism. God developed a system called a, a, a meritocratic. Uh, we have the name of it. I put it. Um, put, they replied that maybe it be enough. Did I put the definition of the um, thing up there? I think I wrote it. It's not on the slide. I might not have included it. Yeah. You know, meritocratus. The idea is you merit what you earn from your 
actions. God's kingdom is built upon that. We'll say, well, no, it's not quite like that. No, read the parable of the talents. God puts things in our hands, and according to our function and what we do in taking responsibility, he rewards us, and we see that here. And for you to decide that because I've done things that have caused, or my merit has caused me to succeed, that I owe you because you've not done those things, that's where entitlement is causing you to suffer. You need to learn. So we, we see this throughout the Bible, this system, a system relating to or characteristic of a society in which power is held by people selected according to merit. That's the definition of it. So I'm sure that it was all said and done. Now, this is one thing I will tell you because another deception of this, because they believe that these things should be shared, you know later on, who do you think the unwise virgins blamed for their expulsion? I bet all five of them sat around and talked about those wicked other wives, those wise, they weren't calling them wise, they were probably calling them idiots, probably cursing them behind their back, hating them because they refused to share. That's the bad guy because they didn't get, and you know that's the mentality that comes out of that, but it's not a fact. Number six, we missed the opportunity to advance. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, well, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Very simply put, because of the foolishness of the five unwise people in this story, what happens? Because they did not prepare themselves, they weren't ready, and they were left out in the cold. So we have to take the stories of the Bible very seriously. We must consider everything that Jesus spoke to us, and I accept all of his words as absolute truth, and therefore I'm going to choose to live my life accordingly. And when I read the word, and I see things like this that cause me to feel corrected, I need to change my life. I made a post about that. I had this thought when I was reading this that, you know, the Bible is a book meant to change us, not to be changed by us. The Bible is a book to craft us, mold us, to shape us, to sculpt us. We cannot change it to suit ourselves. We have to read these things. And because we live on earth by the grace of God, and we do, it becomes easy to be over-dependent upon that grace sometimes. A hyper-grace mentality is dangerous. The enemy uses grace in this age. The enemy is using the concept of grace, at least the perverted form of it, and its doctrines of grace, as a cloak to cover the evils of the concepts of entitlement. They think, well, it's all by grace. Read your Bible. Just read the whole Bible. Yes, grace is there. His grace is sufficient. He's going to help us. He's going to do great things. But we have to be careful. Don't miss your opportunity. Number seven, the last one, we are too late if we do not change. Later, the other, others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, Jesus says now, coming out of the story with the moral of the story. Keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Keeping watch means to study the scriptures and watch ourselves and our behavior. What does it say in 1 Timothy 4, 16? Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The doctrines that we believe and accept are the things written in God's word. Amen? That's the lesson. That's what the Lord told me. We have these seven. We'll put them all up at one time. Seven deceptions of the concept of fairness and entitlement. One, we believe... Our mentality is correct. We think, no, this is the way it is. Well, you, you need to understand what is your pool of thought, where are you forming your mentality, where is your opinion coming from? Make sure it's God's word. Uh, we do not prepare. Number three, we're not, uh, we are deceived by boredom. Boredom is a fact. They all fell asleep, but we need to know and prepare ourselves for it that there will be seasons like that, and we just need to endure. Just go through it patiently. We depend upon others for what is our responsibilities. It was their responsibility to be prepared, but they were depending that, you know, they have oil. They supposed they would certainly share it. Yeah, they're nice girls. They're going to share it. So when the moment came, how would they even know to go and ask them for the extra oil if they hadn't already been aware of the fact that they had extra oil and that they did not? And so that's where we depend upon others 
for our response. We feel that what belongs to others is rightfully ours. And that's just the amazingly strange thing. I've seen this in every realm of life, by the way. I've seen it in missionaries I've worked with through the years. Because God blessed me with a certain sum of money at a certain time. And somehow some of the missionaries thought and they knew and found out and heard about an offering that was given. There was one time a miraculous offering was taken up $35,000 in this one church. And uh, the missionaries that I was associated with and working in my ministry found out about it. And they were all waiting for their part. But the money was not given for that. The money was allocated for other projects and other principles. They all had their amount. They were all supported financially. They were all doing fine. And I distributed accordingly. But somehow they felt if anything comes to me, there would be a pro rata share and equal portions given to everyone in the net. Well, that's not the way it works. But that thought, they, they were suffering from entitlement again. Anything that comes into my hands, I must have to give it to them. But they don't know what I have to pay for and what I have to do, and they don't care. All they care about is what they get. And I've actually broken fellowship with missionaries because of these principles. Because of, and this is why it's such an important subject to me, because I've seen it take people out of the running. I've seen it destroy ministries. I've seen it destroy lives. And in the end, it's going to send people to hell. Very scary. We miss the opportunity to advance. And the thing is that these, I'm going to go ahead and say that these women, in the sake of the story, perhaps they were able to find another husband. But that's not why Jesus told us the story. Jesus told us the story because he was comparing it to himself and his return. We're too late if we don't change. The story is given to us. Why? Beware. Don't be deceived. Jesus gave us this story so that it will not happen to us. Because we're going to be prepared. Look, this is the bottom line. Humility goes so far. The opposite of entitlement is exactly what Jesus tells us to do. When you've done everything you need to do, then call yourself an unprofitable servant. Just have the right attitude. Instead of believing someone owes you something, just talk to God about it and say, God, you know, I, I have these feelings. Bring your feelings of unfairness and your feelings of entitlement to God. Talk it through with him. He will help you through it. He will explain to you. He will give you these passages. He will show you in his word. And he will remold your imagination and your thought. And if you ask him for mercy, he will give you mercy. He's such a merciful God. Even in your state of deception, he loves you. He's caring for you. But he also sometimes has to love you with pain. He also has to sometimes let you get out there to a place where the lesson can be learned. And I know for sure I have been down that road more than once. And I thank God that he did not give up on me, but stays with me. But I want us all to do exactly what that scripture. Watch out that no one deceives you. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, this, this year coming, I'm very excited about 2020. Um, I really believe that it's going to be a year of preparation. I really believe it's a year in which we will learn new things. We will see principles. I don't want to be an alarmist. I don't want to frighten people. But I believe that it's a healthy perspective in this day and this hour to expect that Jesus is returning soon. I'm not going to write a book. I'm not going to suggest that people give up everything and run away and hide in a cave. But your word is true and we can follow it. And you gave warnings concerning this age and you said just be ready. Lord, that whatever spirit is in the land, whatever the concepts of this world are, whatever lies and deceptions are out there, we're going to be free from it because your word is life and it brings us into that. We know the truth and the truth itself will set us free. So Lord, we accept your word. And as we studied it today, if we know truth and it sets us free, at the very moment that we hear these teachings and we go through this, we are letting go of those feelings. We don't deserve anything. Everything is because of your benevolence. Everything is because of your grace. Thank you. Even the very employments that we have, the jobs that we work, and the monies that come from those positions and those functions, that's all in your hands because that can disappear overnight. 
One simple thing, one company can move in a different direction and what was seemingly a secure position can vanish overnight. Technologies can replace all things. But if we trust in the Lord God, we trust in you, Lord. We believe in you. We follow you. And we are prepared. Then nothing will be able to take us down because you're with us. So we call upon your grace. We ask for mercy. We're going to do our part. We're going to prepare ourselves. We're going to make sure that we have the extra oil before that time comes. We're going to not just think about today, but we're also going to think about the future. We're going to think about what we need to be prepared in spirit, what we need to be prepared in the natural so that we can do the things we need to do. Lead us and guide us, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us to learn, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.